In all major road projects these days, construction is by mechanized methods. In conventional concrete construction, the forms used to contain the concrete generally support rails on which the concreting plant runs. Two hopper-type spreading machines are commonly used to spread the concrete, the reinforcement being placed between the two layers. Compaction is achieved by surface vibration, which is often applied to each layer. Finally, regulation of the surface is achieved with a heavy oscillating beam. The levels of all these machines and the accuracy of the final surface depends on the form setting. Accurate setting of forms is essential, and a large labor force is required for this and for moving the forms forward. The cost of form setting is generally about 8% of the cost of the paving operation. An alternative method of concrete road construction developed in the first place to achieve economy where levels were unimportant was the use of sliding forms attached to the paving equipment. These forms were made only of sufficient length for the concrete to stand without slumping after the passage of the machine. Although the slip form principle can be used with separate machines to spread, compact and finish the concrete, it was found to be easier if all the operations were combined in one machine. The delivery of loose concrete in the hopper is agitated by a series of poker vibrators which compact the mass of loose concrete by driving out the air and making it fluid. This fluidity is maintained by a tubular vibrator placed just in front of a conforming plate which engulfs the concrete as the machine moves forward. When the concrete emerges from the conforming plate, it's beyond the range of vibration and retains its shape. The surface is then finished by the screed. With early slip form pavers, the levels of the finished road surface depended upon the accurate preparation of the subgrade under the paver tracks. Machines are now available, however, in which the level of the conforming plate is adjusted from four sensors, one at each corner, working along stretched piano wires. This system provides very good control of the level. The direction of the machine is adjusted from a single vertical sensor working along one of the wires. Some manual control is necessary. Since it seemed possible that the use of slip form papers might result in economies, a full-scale experiment was carried out in 1965 on the Cromwell Bypass, Nottinghamshire, with the cooperation of the County Surveyor and the contractors Robert McGregor and Sons. The experiment was designed to find solutions to difficulties which seemed likely to arise in introducing reinforcement and dull joints. Satisfactory techniques were found for two of the three methods which were tried for introducing reinforcement. One of these was two-layer construction in which the slip form paver encased a bottom layer of concrete on which the reinforcement was placed. The other method used preset steel and the concrete was laid in one layer. With the two-layer method of construction, the concrete for the bottom layer was delivered by lorries running on the base of the carriageway to be laid. Spreader boxes of an American type were used to spread this bottom layer. They were designed for quick attachment to the rear wheels of the end-tipping lorries. Since these lorries ran on the formation, the expansion and contraction joint assemblies could not be placed in position until the bottom layer of concrete had been spread. A very quick erecting type of joint was required and it was necessary to leave spaces for these joints in the spread concrete. The spreader boxes were modified and hydraulically operated gates were fitted which could be closed fairly quickly so that it was possible to leave gaps in the concrete for the joint assemblies. Standard reinforcing mesh was used but in order to control the level of the reinforcement satisfactorily it was modified by omitting some of the welds between the transverse and longitudinal wires. The transverse wires could then be cut and bent down to form supporting legs at the edges of the carriageway and in the middle, where the reinforcement was unsupported by the concrete. The lower layer of concrete and the reinforcement were then encased by spreading concrete through the slip form paver using a side feeding machine. It consisted of a mobile receiving hopper in the adjacent carriageway linked to the slip form paver by conveyor belts which distributed the concrete across the whole front of the machine. If adequate compaction is to be achieved with poker vibrators operating only above the reinforcement, care must be taken in designing the concrete mix. 
This method of construction was the cheapest method used over long lengths at Cromwell. It was cheaper than laying reinforced concrete with conventional plant. In single layer construction, normal reinforcing mesh with some of the welds omitted and the transverse wires bent down to form legs was found to be unsatisfactory for use as preset steel. However, normal reinforcing mesh could be used if it were supported on inverted V supports. With this type of mesh, economies could be made in the costs of the joints because a rapidly erected joint was not essential since the lorries did not run on the formation. A normal cage type joint could be used. Another advantage of this method was that all the concrete was fed to the slip form paver from the side feeder into a more constricted hopper at the front of the paver. Although this required a more efficient side feeder in order to cope with the necessary output, it had the advantage that the concrete was compacted as it was fed past the poker vibrators in the hopper, and the compaction achieved with this method was better than that achieved with two-layer construction. One of the disadvantages of this method was its relatively poor surface finish because the amount of ripple produced over the reinforcing steel was much greater than that generally produced with conventional construction. Another of its disadvantages was its high cost, which was 10% greater than that of two-layer construction. If preset reinforcement is to be generally used, it would be necessary to develop cheaper methods, such as more rigid forms of mesh, in which some of the transverse wires could be cut and bent down or bar mat reinforcement, in which individual bars are made up into mats on the site. Both these methods were tried over short lengths and seem likely to be reasonable if further developed. With bar mat reinforcement, in fact, the cost of the pavement could be less than that using two-layer construction. The third method of reinforcing tried involved picking single steel bars up from the base and feeding them into the concrete in the paver. This may be an even cheaper technique, but needs further development. For unreinforced concrete, high speeds of construction have been obtained by delivering the concrete along the carriageway under construction in front of the paver, but dulled joints had not previously been used. At Cromwell, a joint capable of quick erection was developed and used in unreinforced construction. It consisted of a welded assembly in 13-foot lengths, so that two assemblies were required for the 26-foot wide carriageway. In each assembly, the dowel bars were welded to a steel crack-inducing fillet, supported by four bent legs for contraction joints, six for expansion joints. First, it was necessary to drill holes in the lean concrete base. A special tractor-mounted rig was designed for this purpose. The assemblies were then set up at the correct alignment and sliding sockets were placed on the legs of the assemblies with the lugs inserted into the holes. The holes were then filled with mortar. After the mortar had set, the assemblies were removed and laid alongside the carriageway. All the joints were set out in advance. The expansion joints at spacings of 120 feet and the contraction joints at an average spacing of 15 feet. The carriageway was constructed by running the end tipping lorries on the base and delivering the concrete directly into the slip form paver. With the paver hopper fully charged, the lorries pulled forward and the dowel assemblies were replaced immediately in front of the machine. The time taken to put in the assemblies was short enough not to affect the speed of construction and the accuracy obtained was better than that achieved with the cage joint. However, with this method of construction, End feeding was not found to be markedly faster or cheaper than side feeding, and the cost of the frequent dull joints was high. Thus, the unreinforced concrete pavement was dearer than the reinforced. Unreinforced construction using end feeding seems likely to be attractive at present only where it's necessary to transport all the concrete along the carriageway under construction, such as the dueling of an existing road. In all previous work with the slip form paver, the joints have been sawn. With gravel aggregates, however, there is some risk of random cracking before sawing, and during the experiment at Cromwell, methods were developed for forming joint sealing grooves in the wet concrete. For the longitudinal joint, a rubber bitumen strip was inserted immediately behind the conforming plate on the paver and before the finishing beam. This strip was left in place to form the sealing groove in the finished road. The transverse joints were formed by a wobbly wheel cutter mounted on a self-propelled frame 
in such a way that the cutter could be raised or lowered to give a slot of the correct depth. The wheel, set eccentrically on its shaft, nudges the concrete aside as it moves across the slab. This form of cutter produced very little disturbance at the edge of the concrete. After the groove had been cut, a strip of rubber of rectangular section was inserted and held in tension between wooden clamping boxes placed against the edges of the slab. These boxes also prevented slump at the edges of the slab during the subsequent finishing operations. Following the wobbly wheel cutter, a similar self-propelled frame carried a 10-foot longitudinal finishing float. On either side of the float, small vibrating units about one foot wide were fitted. When the concrete had hardened, the rubber strips could be pulled out easily, leaving clean, straight sealing grooves. With this method of forming the grooves, the riding quality, even with the frequent joints, was equal to that produced by conventional plant-laying reinforced concrete with only one-fifth of the number of joints. The successful experiment at Cromwell has shown that using two-layer construction, reinforced concrete can be laid with the slip form paper more economically than using conventional equipment. This method is likely to give increased productivity and with alternative methods of introducing reinforcement might lead to even greater economies in building the roads of Britain. <laughs>